Hello? Okay. All right, here we go. Nice hot room in a loft on a Monday afternoon, way after lunch. This is going to be great. Just try to stay awake. That's my goal. All right. So we're going to talk about big data search with Solar in HBase. Let's jump right in. Okay, so first I'll do a quick introduction of me and the background for the problem that we had to solve, how we went about solving it, and what we learned along the way. And if everything goes well, that's what your clouds will look like if you put this stuff in the cloud. That's the good version. You'll see the bad version later. So I'm Rod Cope. I'm CTO and founder of OpenLogic. And I've been in software a long time, big companies and small. I'm actually writing a book right now, Cloud Computing in Action for Manning with, with uh, Open Source. And what OpenLogic does in a nutshell is helps companies get support and governance and, and updates on open source. So we support 650 plus packages with SLA support around the world. And we've done this for a couple hundred enterprise customers. If you want, there's a free site, olex.openlogic.com, where you can go research about 350,000 different open source packages and search and, and find what you want, um, look up open source projects, get information, that sort of thing. Okay, so the problem we had to solve when I talk about big data, what this means for open logic in our use case is all the world's open source. So we need to have every package, every version, every single line of code indexed and stored. So the reason why we need to do that is we have uh, one of our products as a scanning tool. And what that does is it looks in your code to find open source. So you can scan binaries or whatever you have installed or your actual source code and find out does it match any open source. So you can comply with licenses, you know, make sure you're in, in compliance with your legal side of the house or if you need to know for security purposes, software update purposes, just what do I have? So in order to know what you have, we have to compare it to everything in existence. And we need to do it fast because users don't want to wait for weeks to get results of that kind of thing. They want to take minutes, uh, maybe an hour if it's a lot of code, but not very long. So we have to have all the metadata for all those projects, where they live, uh, information about where they came from, who's contributing, that sort of thing, along with every single line of code and all the binaries. That means we'd have individual tables that contain terabytes of data. And you may well know that SQL databases don't like that very much. They don't scale nicely. You can't just add a new machine and suddenly you can store a billion more rows and you don't have any other issues. You've got to re-architect. You need to turn off indices and basically disable all the things you like about the relational database in order to make the data fit. With HBase and Solar, we don't have those issues, and we'll talk about how they help. It is growing every day. Every time somebody creates a new open source package, updates a new file, creates a new version, there's more, which means we're constantly adding to the data. We also need real-time access to the data because when you're doing one of those scans, you want instant results, right? So we run these live. But at the same time, we also want to do long-running analysis jobs to spot trends, figure out what are the most popular licenses, popular programming languages, lots of other reasons why we want to crunch through that data. And to have both of those processes of real-time access in the batch going at the same time on the same data is very hard. The good news is HBase and Hadoop and Solar are all very good at this. Who in here, just show hands real quick, is already using Hadoop? A few people, what about HBase? A few less? Mm -hmm. Quarter, maybe. What about solar? A bunch of people using solar. Okay, that's good. Uh, so real quickly, then, most of you familiar, I'd say about a third, roughly, familiar with one of these things. Hadoop gives you a distributed file system, highly scalable, with MapReduce capabilities to do analysis, kind of batch-type jobs. HBase builds on top of Hadoop to give you a NoSQL data store. It's column-oriented, which gives you the real-time access to that data. It also is massively scalable plug in new machines, you can store more data, and your access to the data gets faster. Solar is a search server based on Lucene, and this gives you a number of things. One is it gives you a language-neutral way to, to index and retrieve query on documents. It also scales fairly well. So all of these are well-supported. They've been around for a while. They're flexible. They're fast. All good stuff. 
They can certainly be used in production. We've been in production with this for over two years, the things I'm going to show you today. But there's also a supporting cast of thousands. Under the covers, those main open source projects rely on a whole pyramid of other projects. Things like Stargate, which gives you a restful way to access the data in HBase, so you can get things in and out with any language, not just Java. Uh, we also still use MySQL. Well, we're a primary, primarily a Ruby on Rails shop, but we also use a lot of Java. So having these REST interfaces and other ways to get data in and out is very helpful. Anybody else in here, just show hands real quick, not primarily a Java shop? Just a couple, so Java is everybody else then? <laughs> okay, it's a really heavy Java, okay. If you do decide to go with a scripting language or something else, you'll be glad that there are other ways to get to this data. Okay, we'll talk about a few more of these things later. So what our architecture looks like at OpenLogic today based on these technologies, we have web server and our scanner client accessing the system. We initially come in through Nginx and Unicorn. If you're not familiar with those open source packages, Nginx is a competitor to the Apache web server. Uh, it's very fast, very scalable, and is also a reverse proxy, so it caches. Um, uses a lot less memory than Apache as well. And Unicorn, you can think of that like a, an application server for Ruby on Rails. So incoming requests hit that layer, then they talk to our Ruby on Rails tier, which makes request to MySQL to store information like you're doing a scan, who are you, what are you entitled to do, what company are you representing, that sort of thing. So it's good for a relational database, it's very relational. We also put these scanning jobs into Redis Who's using Redis already? Not many people. OK, if you're not familiar with Redis, this is a great open source project. It is a, what you can think of as a data structure server. So you can store lists and sets, sorted sets, hash maps, and get very fast atomic access to those things from a variety of, of different clients. Um, fast meaning on the order of over 100,000 writes per second. So very, very fast. And we use it for things like uh, creating a job or work queue. So we can just throw new tasks to be performed into Redis, and then a number of other clients can be pulling them off and, and getting the jobs done. And so we use another open source project called Rescue, which is one of those worker setups that works with Redis, so it can pull and pull off new jobs that then get processed in a, in a separate machine or on the same machine in a separate process. Those rescue workers then in turn say, okay, I have a scanning job, what am I looking for? It slices and dices and crunches the data, normalizes it, and then asks Solar, our Solar farm, which is live replicated, hey, do you have a match to any of these lines of code, complete files, chunks of a file, binaries, etc." If there are answers returned, then those rescue workers reach out through the REST interface to Stargate to get the full data out of HBase so it can download the entire file that matched, the metadata on the match, everything it needs to know to, to determine is this the best possible match to return to the user, and then we can do more filtering and, and cleaning from there. And then finally, that worker puts the results back in MySQL so the front end can then pick it up and show it to user in a web UI. Okay, so that's the context we're working in. And then finally, we also have a Maven client uh, to get access to this. Okay, so our Hadoop and HBase implementation is in our private cloud in our data center. And for competitive purposes, I can't give you the exact numbers, but it's well over 100 terabytes of disk, well over 100 CPU cores. And the machines don't have identity. You basically just plug in a new box, it gets added to the, to the Hadoop cluster, added to the HBase cluster, added to the solar farm, and it can now serve up data. So it's very easy to scale. You might ask why not use Amazon EC2 for something like this. There's a number of reasons. One is EC2, oh, let me ask real quick, who here is already using Amazon EC2 or another public cloud? A few people, okay. Um, really good for computational bursts. If you just have a one-time job you need to send it, or maybe you're like uh, eHarmony or Matchmaker, one of those sites that needs to match people looking for each other. They actually up the, upload that data to EC2 every day in a big batch, crunch it for a few hours, get the results, and then shut it all down and turn it off so they don't have to pay for it. 
So that's a, a really good way to use public cloud when you, you have those spikes in demand. Or if you need to scale like your Zynga and you might have a million extra people log into Farmville today, right? And you can't plan on when that's going to happen. Really good. It's very expensive, however, for long-term storage of big data when you're talking about 100 terabytes plus. And we'll look at the economics of that in just a minute. It's also finally not yet consistent enough for mission-critical use of HBase because HBase relies on ZooKeeper under the covers. And ZooKeeper is an open source project that helps you coordinate among a bunch of different machines for distributed computing. So it can do things like elect leaders and negotiate who's the master now and has heartbeats and can make sure all the cluster nodes are up. It's very latency sensitive. So if you have a sudden spike where you're used to maybe 20 or 50 millisecond response times between machines in a cluster and suddenly it hits two or 3,000 milliseconds like happens on Amazon on occasion, the zookeeper will say, oh, wow, that other guy's down. I'm going to go into failover mode and ignore him, spin up another node, kind of do that whole, whole dance of there's been a failure when three seconds later this guy's back up and says, no, I'm here. And the first one says, it's too late. You're dead to me. You're, you're, forget it. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. So you just thrash. You just constantly go up and down, and that can cause a lot of problems. So until either that gets smoothed out at Amazon, which is probably unlikely just due to the nature of the public cloud, or more likely the Zookeeper and HBase teams will work on this, uh, it's probably not quite ready yet. Okay. Your, yeah, so your clouds, as I mentioned before, can go from sunny to ugly, like I think it happened outside today. All right, so on the economic side of things, if you are storing big data, 100 terabytes plus in EC2, if you look at EBS storage, the prices come down a lot lately, which is really good. They keep lowering the prices. The bad news is even 10 cents per gigabyte when multiplied by something like 100 terabytes is a big number, 120,000 US dollars a year. That's a lot to rent some disk space. Right? You can buy a lot of disk for that money. You also need to put double extra large instances in the EC2 to get reserved. So you have around that magic 32 gigabytes of RAM number that HBase and Hadoop and Solar kind of really like if you're going to put them on a node together. And for that, you'll get about 13 compute units. And that comes up to about $175,000 US dollars. Sorry, I should have translated these or converted these. You can reserve, so you can pay in advance to get a lower hourly rate, um, but it's still, again, pretty pricey. And if you net this out and do your averages, we're looking at you know, almost a quarter million US dollars a year for that. If instead I went to the Dell site and bought my own and I got 20 servers, it's going to cost about a quarter of the price. All right. So at Amazon, I'm going to get about 260 compute units of power for that price. By my own, I'm going to get about 660 compute units. A lot more computing power for a lot smaller price. And now a lot of people are going to say, well, you didn't include all the admin costs. And that's true. It does not incl include hosting costs. Anybody in the room think they can't host 20 machines for about 150,000 euros a year? Don't raise your hand, because it doesn't cost that much. Not even close. And you also don't lose all the system administration. You still have to own the instances. You have to monitor them. You have to debug them when something goes wrong. You've got to support it. You're just getting out of the hardware side of it. So it's still important, but think about your use case. And you know, don't, uh, don't do that with your money. So be careful where it goes. OK. So let's talk for a minute about getting data out of HBase. So data, HBase is not a SQL database. So don't think about performing queries like SQL queries. Think of it more like a fancy hash table, where I have keys and values, and I want to look something up by its primary key, essentially. It's, it's more powerful than that but not a whole lot. Think more in terms of scanning versus querying. If you have big blocks of data that you want to go through and look at every row, that makes sense. But you're not going to do complex joins or the equivalent of what you get in SQL. So you might say, well, then how do I get my data out, if that's the case? The good news is we have solar. So solar is very fast, pretty scalable, and it has built-in sharding and replication. And so with its Lucene base, with its dynamic schema, 
you can create very complex queries and, and have faceted search results if you're familiar, familiar with any kind of shopping site where you have facets like prices or vendor or brand, that kind of thing on the side of the page that you can click. Solar can return all of those in one round trip. So it's very fast about that. Uh, you also get with Solar the REST-based interface. So you can use REST, or you can get XML, or you can get JSON, you can get Ruby formats. There's a lot of different ways you can put data in and get data out of Solar. So it's extremely convenient. You also get sharding. And the way that works, and we're going to see this graphically in just a minute, but you can query any Solar instance in the cluster, and it will in turn ask all of its peers the same question and it will aggregate the results and hand them back to you. So as a client, you don't have to really know much about that. You also get async replication. And so slaves query their masters, which means you can even replicate across data centers if you like. There's a repeater concept. So how we use Solar at OpenLogic is we have a Solar farm uh, that is sharded, is cross-replicated, and we use HA proxy in front of it. Anybody here using HA proxy? Just a few? Um, HA Proxy is a really nice, again, open source project that gives you round robin proxying or failover uh, across a bunch of machines. So it can replace a hardware load balancer, for example. It's very fast and it's very, very stable. You basically start it once and you don't have to worry about it going down on you. So what we do is we put HA Proxy in front of these things so that we can load balance the writes across the masters and the reads across the servers. And we'll see more of that in just a minute. And with this technique, we've indexed billion, many, many billions of lines of code individually in HBase, as well as full source files, full binary files, all of it, all open source, indexed a bunch of different ways. In fact, over 20 different solar fields indexed per file, and some of them are huge. So it scales very nicely. So the way this looks is with HA proxy out front, we have a number of machines, in this case, I've shown up to 26 machines just because they fit the letters of the, my alphabet, so it's convenient. Uh, we put the masters and the slaves on different machines. So a master will replicate to a slave on a, the machine next to it, and so it cascades. And the benefit of that layout is that if we lose any particular slave, we can still read and write to the master with that same shard of data on it. And if we lose any master, we can still access the data to this, from the slave, so we can still get and query all our data, and we can just write to a different master in the cluster. So again, we're still fully up. Or we can lose one entire machine, because that's just the same as losing a master in a separate, unrelated slave. So everything is still accessible. We can still read and write. So the way a write works, then, is when we write to the system, we'll get balanced over to a a particular master, and then the data gets replicated to its slave. The next time we write, we'll just get round robin over to the next master, replicated to its slave, and etc. So that's pretty easy. For read, we get balanced to one of the slaves by default, and then the slave will in turn ask each of its peers the same query. So behind the scenes, it will ask each of them, collect all the results, and then hand back the aggregated answer to your client. So you don't have to know any of how that works from the client point of view. You simply make a query, and the rest happens for you. Okay. On a delete, because we're round robining across all the writes, we don't know which server contains any particular piece of data. What we do is we just have to do the, the delete on all of the masters to make sure it's completely gone wherever it happened to live in the cluster. And this also means you can easily just add new machines whenever you like, and your deletes will still work correctly, as will the reads and writes. So it scales quite well. Now, if there's a problem, and you have a machine go down in the middle of a write, what that looks like, for example, if the master on machine one goes down, when we go to write to that machine, we'll have a failure. The machine won't be there, it won't respond, or it'll time out, or something will be wrong. And what we'll do is simply retry, in which case we'll get load balance to the next master. We'll write to it. It'll flow onto its slave, and everything's good. Okay. In the read case, it's very similar to what we saw before, where we get balance to one of the slaves to read. 
And now before I show the simplified version of this, what actually happens is the slave, instead of asking its peers directly, it also goes through the load balancer. So if one of its peer slaves failed, we'll ask the load balancer, hey, give me this shard, wherever that lives, give me the next piece. When it gets directed to the one that's failed, it will simply retry again, and this time it will get routed to the master for that slave that it was trying to read from. So again, the read still completes, and I'll ask the final read slave, aggregate the results, and send it back. Hope that made sense. I know it's late on Monday and it's hot. Try to keep with it. Okay, so to make all that work, you can guess there's a lot of configuration, right? There's a lot of moving parts there to set up correctly. It's really easy to let something slip through, a typo, some other kind of issue. So I very highly recommend you use something like Chef or Puppet or CF Engine. It, who here is using Chef already? A few people? How about Puppet? A few more people. That's interesting. What about CF Engine? Yeah, as usual, nobody uses CF Engine. Don't use it. Uh, but it is interesting. I've, I've asked dozens of Fortune 500 companies what they're using today, and Chef is at least nine or ten to one times is more popular than Puppet, but in this room it's almost the opposite, so that's interesting. Maybe it's a, a geog geographic thing. Uh, you do have to pay very close attention to the details, so things like the operating system, maximum number of open files and sockets, that sort of thing. Important to make sure you get that right, and I highly recommend you follow all the tips on the, the HBase troubleshooting page on their wiki. They'll give you a, a lot of instructions for both Hadoop and HBase, and I, I definitely think you should follow them. It's easy to skip things saying, well, that doesn't look like it applies to me, or I don't need that yet. Do it now because you'll forget to do it later and you'll get bit like I've been bitten, and it's, it's not much fun to debug for hours on end. Just do it up front and get it over with. Um, I'll talk about solar merge factors and norms in a minute, and the other tip is don't starve these for memory. You don't want either HBase or solar to hit swap space because they'll really, really slow down and things will go badly wrong. They, they may actually start to fail in ugly ways. So buy some RAM and be happy. All right, commodity hardware. I think everybody's probably heard the concept that Hadoop, you can use commodity hardware. I just want to clarify that we're not talking about that. Not, that's not what we mean. Don't, don't look under the, your desk for uh, you know, the old machine that nobody's touched for three years or look in the supply closet or up in your attic or your old you know, Commodore 64 or whatever. It's not going to work. We're talking about dual quad-core, 32 gig of RAM, bunch of disks kind of systems. Um, don't bother with RAID on the system, though, because Hadoop already, by default, replicates every block to three machines and even across racks if it can, so don't need of that. But I do recommend enterprise drives because the rotational vibration when a bunch of those boxes shake on the cluster, you'll have more failures if you don't pay for the drives with the extra little styrofoam or whatever it is that pads those things. And you will have ugly problems. It is commodity hardware. What we actually roll out at OpenLogic is dual quad-core and hex-core boxes, 32 to 64 gig of RAM, and we do use ECC RAM, the error-correcting RAM, and that's recommended by Google, too, because when you're putting terabytes and petabytes of data through the RAM of these, these boxes, even that one-in-a-million problem starts to happen frequently. So th weird things like bit errors in your RAM can cause real problems, and you don't want it to bug that, trust me. Um, six two-terabyte drives. Now, I just said don't use RAID in here. I say use RAID, and you're like, what are you talking about? Use RAID on the OS drives if you want. This is what we do. It makes me feel better. I sleep better at night to have the OS mirrored on two disks. And it's all we, so where we put Hadoop, HBase, Solar, all of our code, key data backups that are just hard to recover, that sort of thing. It's just convenient. You don't have to do it, but it, it keeps your boxes up more often, more frequently. And then give Hadoop data node all the rest of the drives. We do use enterprise switches, redundant because Hadoop likes a lot of bandwidth, so does HBase. It's constantly moving blocks, big blocks of data around, and you don't want to saturate your network, so the more bandwidth you can get, the better. I think we heard that this morning, too. So expect, with commodity hardware, lots of things to go wrong. Power supplies, drives, uh, Linux has kernel panics. It, 
you'll get zombie processes, drop packets. All these things happen because if you're shoveling this much data through it and you're going 24-7, all the weird corner cases you almost never see in normal life, you'll see all the time in this environment, which is not much fun. Um, Hadoop fails, HBase fails, Stargate fails, Solar fails. They all have problems. They're not perfect. All software has bugs. So just get used to it. Put monitoring in place and just automatically restart these things, log these things, etc. And your code will have weird problems if you, you put enough data through it with terabytes and hundreds of terabytes. The equivalent of people with no names and every other weird corner case that you wouldn't expect to happen will happen. So test as, as much as you can. Yeah, you'll, you'll be that guy at some point, debugging for hours on end. So it's cutting edge stuff. There's still that single point of failure around name node with Hadoop. Uh, HBase, there's still uh, sort of competing, or not maybe not competing, not quite production ready, replication and other solutions. With Solar, there's Solar Cloud, there's Kata, there's Elastic Cloud, there's Lily. There's a lot of different ways to solve this problem. But at the point of time when we need to pick a solution, none was quite production ready yet. Um, Lily may be a little different, but Solar Cloud, Kata Elastic Cloud, not quite to my comfort level yet, but your mileage may vary. They're definitely worth exploring. When you load big data, uh, experiment with what are called the solar merge factors. This is one of the configuration parameters that determines how many uh, index files or separate indexes are on the disk in one solar instance. And so the more of them you have, the faster you can index new data coming in because it has to work with smaller index files that can just create new ones. However, when you are searching, you want fewer index files because it, that means it has to do less work and it has, to, it has less aggregating of results to do across those files. So that means when you're doing a major import, when you're starting a project and you're batch or bulk updating everything, you want a high merge factor in a lot of files, and then later when you're ready to go to more query production, then you can change that value live, actually, in solar, and you get faster query performance. So I recommend you start with something like maybe 25, and then change it later to something like 5, and you can do that with the curl command, and you can look that up. Okay. I would recommend highly you test all your big data loading, and so, this will help you point out weird corner cases in your code and also the way you're using Hadoop and HBase. It also helps you look for any SKUs in solar. So if you're sharding and you have a bunch of different machines, when you load a huge amount of data, it's easy to have one machine you know, indexing a lot more data than another just due to random sort of allocations or the size of the data. So just check on that. Um, and one tip is, in order to know how much data Solar has, you can look in disk in the directory with your index files. But those sizes can be misleading because until you do what's called a Solar commit, and then you may have to do what's called an optimize, and you may have to write more data again and then commit and optimize again, then Solar will really tell you what's there. Otherwise, you might be looking at cache data or something is in memory, or it's trying to avoid hitting disk just for speed purposes, and so might kind of accidentally lie to you. So try hard to make that, make that go, okay? And make sure your replication slaves are keeping up. Don't use the little Commodore 64 as your replication slave to your big monster, you know, 16 core box. Try to use the same exact hardware if you can because you don't want them to get behind. Also, don't commit to solar too frequently. And commit, this is not like a relational database. When you commit to solar, it just says, make everything since the last commit now become available to somebody doing a query so that they can see your data. But it's already safe. It's on disk. It's OK. You just can't see it until you do a commit. Don't do that too frequently. Um, if you're trying to do that every time you add new data to HBase, for example, you'll kill Solar. Too many commits will stack up because it can take a few seconds or even a few minutes to commit based on how much data you've put into Solar since the last commit. So don't do that too often. You'll kill it. I would also try to avoid putting too large values in HBase. Like, it, don't put over 5 meg, roughly, into one single cell. So this is in a table, in one row, in one column. Keep that down to a reasonable size. You can store billions of rows times millions of columns. That's OK. Just don't make any one particular cell too big, or you'll run into instability kind of performance issues. 
Uh, also, don't use one box to load your whole cluster because you may not live long enough to see it finish. <laughs> big data is really big. Um, with the open source that we have, and just one of our custom machines, one of our sysadmins did an ls-r, just trying to do a recursive listing of directories, and the Linux box ran for over 24 hours without showing a single line of output. So big data means big. So what we do is we actually spread all the data across all the different nodes, NFS, mount things, and then load simultaneously from all the boxes and all the hard drives into HBase initially. And that runs thousands of times faster than trying to load it from one central source. And if you have a massive data load like that, in HBase, you can call this set right to wall false. false. This is a write ahead log. You want, to, you want that on in production so you don't lose data if something goes wrong. But during your initial load, it will load way, way faster if you turn this off. So it's a good tip. This also lets you test solar and load balancing and everything else uh, in your system as you go before you get in production. So for, I think, everybody in the room is a Java person almost. So one tip about using scripting languages, they can really help for doing things like MapReduce jobs. If you've ever written a Hadoop MapReduce job, it can be 50 or 60 lines of boilerplate Java code. Or it can be two or three lines of Ruby or JRuby code if you use a project like Wukong, which helps you very quickly write MapReduce jobs. Very tiny, very easy to read. We use it all over the place at uh, OpenLogic. And just an, a, an example, here's 27 lines of JavaScript that filters a simple list. And the same thing in four lines of Groovy or Ruby. So which is better, one or two? One or two? <laughs> good, they do that in uh, Germany. They have optometrists to say one and two. That's good. I was hoping that wouldn't fall down. And this is not possible without open source. Like I mentioned before, it's the tip of the iceberg is Hadoop and HBase and Solar. But there's uh, dozens and dozens of projects under those and under those and under those. So it'd be impossible to build or buy everything. Uh, look, at, look to open source first would be my recommendation. So final thoughts. You can host this big data. You can solve problems where you need to scale and look up and have real-time access concurrently with batch trends and analysis jobs. You couldn't have done this a few years ago. This is something new that open source has given us with HBase and Solar and Hadoop. Uh, it's very fast to get started in prototype, but be careful that it takes a lot longer to get into production with some of this stuff because of all those weird corner cases you run into. Uh, we had things up and running in a couple weeks, and it took us six plus months to get everything totally production ready uh, with scaling and testing and failover and, all, and monitoring everything you need. So they're very fast. Give a memory and stand back. HBase will scale as much as you can afford hardware. Solar, you can scale to a point. I would say don't worry if you only have five or ten machines worth of data, which is quite a bit because you're only storing indices, not the entire data. But if you need to have more than one whole rack, then you might want to think of, of application-specific sharding of data, not just purely the automatic sharding from solar. And that's my wrap-up. And Do we have any time for questions, or are we all out? Five minutes? Okay, good. Any questions? There's one over here. Do you ever do updates to the solar indices? Do we do updates to the solar indices? So, in other words, are we loading data live into the system? Yes, we are. Yeah, so we continually uh, run separate indexing jobs while the system is live in production, while users are doing scans. So yeah. how do you know on which shard uh, the document is indexed previously? So the question is, how do we know where the documents are? Like which shard? The way the querying works is all the shards get queried every time we do a query. So it doesn't matter where they got put. We'll still find the answer. OK. Uh, I think there's one in the back. Yeah. Um, have you considered um, some of these ideas floating around, like Lusandra, where you can scale um, Lucene over a scalable um, store? They're um, like HBaseine or having the index in HBase directly. And if you considered it, why didn't you use something like that or impl um, 
do something like that. Okay, so the question is, did I consider Lusandra, Lucene plus Cassandra, or I'll expand that question and say, why didn't we consider Solar Cloud or Lily or Kata? There's a number of these solutions. Um, as I mentioned, we've been in production now for over two years, so none of them really existed <laughs> at the point we used them. I would say today, I think there's still some advantages to using HBase. If you're familiar with the CAP theorem, you know, consistency, availability, and partitional intolerance, you need to pick two for your use case. And depending on the storage mechanism you use underneath, there's some architectural trade-offs you need to make. HBase is consistent and that worked well for what we were trying to do, so I wanted something H-based, -based, whereas Cassandra lets you sort of pick your own two legs of the, tr of the cap stool based on what you're storing, and to me that meant additional complexity, and it wasn't designed only for specifically the, the part of cap I needed, which meant, in my mind, it was more complex than it needed to be to solve my problem. Also, it was, a, it was definitely immature at the time I needed to, to choose it. If I were looking today, I would certainly put Cassandra back in the race. Uh, same thing with Solar Cloud and Lily and Kata, but they just weren't there when I needed to choose. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Um, um, are you getting any problems uh, with um, solar sharding? Uh, with respect to the the um, results that come out, as compared to a single to single instance. Well, so the question is, am I having any problems with the solar sharding? Like maybe not getting the data I think I should get out of it. For example, um, there there's definitely been some hiccups over the last <laughs> last two years, and so I would say one of the th the things you really need to do if you're going to use solar like this is to have really good monitoring on all the different processes and all the replication to make sure that something doesn't get behind because every once in a while solar will fall down and uh, it needs to be you know, put back up, replication needs to get restarted or rebooted sometimes and solar occasionally will run out of memory, you'll overload it with clients. And, but if you have automatic monitoring and automatic failover restarts, things work a lot better. I think we're about out of time, but th thanks for the questions. And I'll be around if you need me.